Uh, we hope you'll find us of interest. We'll make this an interactive session. I'm gonna give a very brief introduction and, and specifically, um, um, we talk just broadly about where congenital scoliosis fits into pediatric spinal deformity. And, and specifically when we think about uh, scoliosis is fine, we've got our early onset forms of scoliosis and congenital scoliosis of course is an important variant of an early onset deformity. And uh, we've talked previously about neuromuscular deformity, certainly in the adolescent patient, that's important. But we're also recognizing that even more in the adults. There are lots of different syndromes. Uh, this is a neurofibromatosis case. And you know, of course, our idiopathic cases are most common. Then in a child, we also think often about the sagittal plane, uh, either Sherman's kyphosis, spondylolisthesis. And one of uh, my mentors in the pediatric spine is, is John Hall. And, and John Hall, uh, said quite famously, uh, quite often, he said, the decision of whether or not to operate is far more important than the decision of how to do surgery. I, I suggest that both are important, but whether or not to operate is so important in the pediatric spine, and um, th th especially in the transition uh, from the, the, the early childhood to adolescence through adulthood. And, and so when do we operate on the adolescent or on the child? It depends a lot on understanding the natural history and I think there are a lot of circumstances where you can safely and, and perhaps even sagely uh, observe the spine into adulthood. But at the same time, I think there are a lot of uh, situations where the natural history is not so benign and an early operation makes sense. Uh, examples of this, patients with the dysplastic oldocesis is likely to get worse over time. Uh, patients, uh, th this is an example of a patient, two different patients, but a patient with a relatively mild a 1B deformity here. So when do we operate on the 1B deformity to prevent it from becoming uh, this type of a, a double major curve into an, an adulthood? So really understanding natural history of deformity is so important. And it, uh, our decision-making has a lot to do with the, the patient perspective and the child, certainly the parents are also a big part of the perspective. And of course, the physician's uh, perspective is important here as well. When we think overall about our goals of care, in the child, our goals uh, are to both correct the deformity, but also to prevent the progression of deformity. And ultimately, we want to improve health related quality of life. And in the child, we measure this by disability adjusted life years. And again, in the child, we're not so much thinking necessarily about improving present health status, because a lot of uh, children with deformity really haven't got much compromise at present. Whereas in the adult, we're improving present health related quality of life. In the child, we're really trying to avoid the consequences of deformity progression. And it really is the congenital curves that, that have the most tendency towards deformity progression or towards severe deformity with cardiopulmonary complications and with mortality. Um, so again, inform, informed choice really requires information about the natural history and information about also patient and parent preferences and values. Some of the classic literature I think is worth going through briefly, and most of you know the work of Alf Nockhamsen. So uh, Professor Nockhamsen in Sweden, he looked at uh, a, a large series of patients with scoliosis. Now, a lot of these patients had post-polio deformity, uh, uh, osteomalacia, or rickets. Uh, most of them were idiopathic, but a lot of these were early onset scoliosis. And the point I want to make here is that um, the conclusion was that the observed death rate was quite a bit higher than the age adjusted or the expected death rate. But having said that, the clear distinction that's made is the patients with infantile and juvenile or early onset scoliosis had an observed death rate that was different than the expected death rate. The patients with adolescent deformity really had no difference at all at, at any age group. So it's the infantile, early onset, juvenile scoliosis cases that we want to address early. And those are the ones that really become severe deformity and have a difference in mortality and long-term consequences, including uh, cardiopulmonary compromise. And this is some uh, famous work that was done uh, by the group in London. And this is in distinction to the work that Stu Weinstein did looking at 50-year follow-up of patients with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. And in this instance, looking at adolescents <clears throat> with idiopathic scoliosis, they're really untreated uh, um, a late onset scoliosis. Uh, these patients had very little decrement in either productivity or, or functions, and, and only the most severe curves had some measurable decrement or increase in back pain to compared to a control population. So with that as a background, some of what we're dealing with in this session is be when do we operate on the child, 
and when should we observe deformity into the adulthood? And I would suggest that there's a lot of 1A curves. And I know Lionel, my, my partner who does a lot of pediatric work, <clears throat> agrees that uh, there's a lot of 1A curves that we certainly can very well observe into adulthood. And, and that uh, these thoracic primary curves don't tend to become very symptomatic in adulthood. Whereas the curves involving the lumbar spine, I think, uh, and especially our congenital curves, have a much more concerning and worrisome natural history. And that natural history, again, can involve cardiopulmonary uh, compromise and can involve early mor mortality. So what, what the fellows uh, put together uh, for this session, and, and uh, I thanks especially to Joe Mendelis, who's uh, one of our fellows who came to us uh, uh, from New York, from the um, Montefiore program, and, and uh, Joe's going to be going out to Los Angeles um, uh, working with the, the Scoy Clinic in Los Angeles after his fellowship. So Joe put together, uh, uh, Joe and the other fellows put together four cases. And Joe, with that as a background, I'll, I'll let you uh, take over the screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Bourbon, and thanks everybody for uh, joining us today. Um, so uh, I put together these two cases that I actually got from Dr. Metz. And I think these two cases are really nice to put together because they sort of illustrate how it's very important uh, to catch these uh, congenital scoliosis patients early. And if you do that, it can really change in certain circumstances, the magnitude of the surgery they may need for correction. Uh, so I'm gonna get through both of these uh, and then we'll take some questions about them together. Uh, our first patient's a seven-year-old female who presented the clinic for evaluation of scoliosis, uh, participated in swimming and gymnastics, never had any problems. Uh, the patient was having recurrent UTIs and underwent avoiding cystourethrogram, and at that time on the imaging, a spine abnormality was noted, so they were referred to our clinic for evaluation. Uh, they had no back pain, no neurological symptoms, and no past medical or surgical history. So on exam, they had an onontologic gait, no ataxia. They had an Adams forward bend test with a seven-degree left-sided lumbar tilt and a normal neurovascular exam. These are the in images that they presented with initially in clinic, and they were notable for a hemivertebrae at the L3 level and a mild limb length discrepancy. And this hemivertebrae at this time was causing about a 26 degree uh, curve uh, focused just at the level above and below the hemivertebrae. So after a discussion with the patient's family and Dr. Metz, they opted for some observation and to come back to clinic in six months for repeat imaging to see if there was progression of the deformity. So they ended up returning to clinic about eight months later, and that's the image you could see here on the left. And the deformity at this point had progressed to about 35 degrees. And um, again, they discussed uh, potential treatments, including bracing, surgery, or observation, and they opted for uh, continued observation for the time being, and then returned again to clinic at 20 months after the initial presentation, where at this time, um, the deformity had progressed to about 40 degrees. Um, after discussion with the family and discussing what their goals were in terms of um, minimizing the progression of this, they decided to undergo operative treatment. So uh, at that time, a preoperative uh, planning CT scan was obtained, and I think this shows uh, the anatomy of the deformity very nicely. You have a uh, hemivertebrae that is uh, partially segmented, and um, you could see on the 3D CT scan uh, very nicely, a nice outline of what the deformity looks like. So uh, this patient underwent uh, posterior column osteotomies at L2-3 and L3-4, uh, followed by excision of the L3 hemivertebrae, and then a posterior spinal fusion from just L2 to L4 with instrumentation and iliac crest autograph. Here you can see the initial post-op x-rays, and then these are the x-rays that we have at the most recent follow-up, which is about two months after surgery. This case was fairly recent, so this is the, um, the most recent follow-up that we have. Uh, the correction has been maintained, and you can see that a very minimal procedure was able to be done because the deformity had been monitored and was caught early. Um, our next patient is a little bit different. This is a 12-year-old female who presented to clinic for evaluation of scoliosis uh, after an abnormality was noticed by her pediatrician. Uh, she was active in swimming and dance, and she had no symptoms or complaints. Um, of note, she was postmenarchal at the time of presentation and was nearing skeletal maturity. Um, her gait uh, exam was non ontologic and um, her, she had an Adams forward bend test that was notable for a five degree right sided thoracic and eight degree left sided lumbar tilt with a normal neurovascular exam. So this is her imaging on presentation, uh, notable for an L2 hemivertebrae with an associated 49 degree curve and a contralateral bar. Um, due to the higher magnitude of this curve, uh, she was indicated for um, excision of the hemivertebrae and uh, correction of her deformity. And on the CT scan, uh, you could see here that she has this hemivertebrae. And then on the contralateral side, you could see this, the fusion on the, um, on the opposite side of the hemivertebrae. Uh, it's important to note that these uh, hemivertebrae with contralateral bars are 
at an increased risk for rapid progression. So here's a 3D CT scan um, where you could see the hemivertebrae on one side and uh, um, fused uh, posterior elements on the other. So she underwent resection of her L2 hemivertebrae, uh, Smith-Peterson osteotomies at L12 and L34, a right-sided L23 T lift, and a posterior spinal fusion from T12 to L4. These are her initial post-op standing x-rays. And this is her correction at two years post-op. So showing that she had uh, good maintenance of correction. She's still doing very well and participating in activities. Uh, Dr. Metz, was there anything you wanted to uh, chime in about about these cases? Thanks very much, Joe. I, th I think the, uh, in terms of technical um, pearls for the first case, uh, I think I saw in the chat, um, you know, why not do a convex epiphysiodesis? And I think that's a, a reasonable option. I think um, in the case where we could sort of guarantee at time zero uh, that we have a balanced correction uh, with the resection of the hemivertebra, that's sort of my treatment of choice. Um, I'd love for others to chime in if that, if they would do um, something like epiphysiodesis as an alternative, I'd be interested to hear their rationale, but that's just not something that I typically do in my practice. Um, for that first case with the semi-segmented hemivertebra, um, you really don't need to resect the whole thing. You need to resect, uh, in that case, the um, hemivertebra was uh, attached to the lower, uh, at the lower disc space, but uh, fully segmented above. And so to achieve a solid orthodesis, you need to resect the disc above and then a, as much of that hemivertebra as, as is needed to get a balanced uh, coronal correction. Uh, in the second case, you know, the questions that might come up are why did we use a, a T lift cage on the contralateral side from the hemivertebra? And again, that was just um, to uh, aid in uh, achieving a, a complete coronal correction. Um, one important pearl with this patient, because um, of the severity of her deformity, she was compensating quite a bit um, with pelvic obliquity. And so it took, you know, her initial uh, post-op film standing, post-op films were fairly horrifying um, as she was very decompensated in the coronal plane. And so with, with these cases, you have to anticipate that and um, counsel patients that they will need a shoe lift on the perceived shorter leg that you decrease in height over time until, they're, until they basically have, um, uh, you know, until their comp compensatory mechanism has, has resolved and they can stand upright. But that for this patient took a full six months before she was, uh, uh, walking without a limp, and now she's walking normally. Would brace. Uh, some, some other questions there is uh, Jens uh, Chapman asked when you're doing that convex side re uh, resection, what, what do you do with uh, there's, there's a, a root above and a root below typically, and uh, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so in the lumbar spine, of course, we can't sacrifice any roots. Uh, I trace out. Um, you know, I, I, I perform a laminectomy and um, in the case, Joe, can you go back to the, uh, maybe that the AP on the first case there? Um, I trace out the root above, uh, the root at the hemivertebra and I see a bit of the tra traversing root that's gonna be exiting below the hemivertebra. So you wanna be able to, you know, uh, know that the nerves are safe during the hemivertebra resection. Uh, sometimes these cases you can have conjoined roots as well. And so I think it's, it's really important that you have, uh, you know, you clearly see the exiting roots at the level above the hemivertebra as well as the level um, at the hemivertebra. And I'll just add to that, uh, Lionel, that a couple of things that make this a little bit easier is that uh, typically we're taking out the, the convex side, of course. And uh, so these hemivertebra tend to be posterolateral. And Joe showed, did a nice job of showing that on a CT scan. So yeah. these uh, tend to uh, come out uh, quite easily, especially when they're segmented. Um, in terms of the cage, the cage tends to go in on the contralateral side. So uh, for example, it's an L3 a hemivertebra, we can call that an L3A, mm -hmm. and the uh, cage would go in on the concave side. Uh, so we, we don't have such a nerve root crowding on that side. And that's how you did it right now. Yeah. 
Exactly right. Yep. Exactly right. So you basically perform sort of a standard T lift on the contralateral side from the hemivertebra and purposefully leave the cage rather than anteriorly leave the cage on that side. Now, another question, uh, and I'll, I'll let you start with this, um, which is, uh, were, were these resections done uh, front and back or, or, or posterior only? And uh, yeah, why don't you go start? Yeah, that's a great question. I, these were done posterior only. Uh, certainly, you know, the, historically they've been done front and back, either staged or simult simultaneously. Um, I have always done these uh, posterior only, not only because, as uh, Dr. Bourbon mentioned, the hemivertebra typically sits posterior laterally as the spine um, above and below the hemivertebra tends to rotate um, away from it. But, um, and so you can access it very easily from the back, but it's just easier, I believe, to control your correction um, at the same time as uh, you're doing your resection. And again, the importance of tracing out the roots can't be overstated um, in terms of neurologic safety. Now, I'll maybe add to that a little bit. Uh, you know, certainly when I learned how to do, do these uh, from, from John Hall, uh, we, we actually did these with sort of a simultaneous uh, front and back approach. Uh, so we, we'd have a, a, a long you know, thoracolumbar approach anteriorly and release the, the hemivertebra and then, and then uh, work posteriorly. I, I think for most people who, who do adult spine surgery, certainly doing three column osteotomies for deeper collar sections, uh, we're, we're quite a bit more comfortable uh, working around the neural elements uh, and, and to that end, um, pretty, pretty much all of these now, I, I think, are done from a, a posture only approach by, by our group. Yeah. And, um, one, one final question here, uh, Lionel, about the um, um, hemipiphysis, or may, maybe I'll take a shot at this because you, you already addressed this a little bit, is, is when may a, a hemipiphysis be a, a, a useful alternative? And, and I do think that there are circumstances where that can be a, a very reasonable way to address the convexity of, of a deformity. Uh, specifically, um, in a younger patient, uh, the, the rule that John, John Emmons has published about it is in patients under age five with curves of less than 50 degrees, then a hemipiphysis, when there is concave growth potential, is, is uh, uh, perhaps a, a reasonable approach as a less invasive approach. Um, the, the trouble, of course, is the predictability of the concave growth potential. And uh, that's something that, you know, with, with the MRI scans, uh, uh, um, we can see the degree of segmentation. We, we would see what's happening on, on the concave side. Obviously, if there's a concave bar, we're really not going to be thinking about uh, hemiopathesis with uh, overgrowth on the opposite side. Um, but in a patient under age five, curves less than 50 degrees, that, that can be a reasonable option. I think that um, at this point, most of our group tends to do, if we're going to do surgery, tends to do the hemivertebral resection, uh, just because we get a much more predictable control over that segment of the spine. And, uh, and especially, I think, the, the case that Joe showed first, where uh, uh, putting L2 completely parallel to L3, he had complete, uh, line on complete control of that segment. There was no question about whether or not that concave side needed to overgrow a little bit. And, uh, I think we get much better control and predictable results with the uh, hemivertebral section. Yeah. Completely agree. Yeah. The, the bracing question, maybe we'll get back to that because there, there's a, I think our last case, uh, that, that's a relevant question. So if it's okay, we'll, we'll put that bracing question uh, and jelly uh, towards the end. And maybe now we'll transition and, and have uh, Dr. Theologis, who, who uh, Dr. Theologis has hosted a number of, of, of these meetings now including a very nice session on, on tumors recently. And Dr. Theologis has been presenting one of his cases. So go, go ahead, Alekos. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, thank you to the Seattle Science Foundation for this opportunity. It's a great forum and I uh, really enjoyed presenting here. Um, so this is a case um, that I did uh, about two, two to three months ago and I'm excited to share with you. So this is a 26 year old female was born in India, diagnosed with a quote unquote spinal deformity, was never really treated, um, then uh, immigrated to the US and uh, presented to my clinic for evaluation of worsening mid back pain and uh, worsening posture. She was a very healthy uh, young woman, married, two children, uh, and no bad habits. You can see on examination, she presented with a prominent, very prominent right 
thoracolumbar rib prominence and kyphosis. Um, her shoulders and her pelvis were level, uh, but she, she did have a, a noticeable right trunk shift and also um, creases in her abdomen. These were her presenting radiographs, uh, full length uh, sagittal and, um, and uh, coronal images. Um, and what we see on the uh, sagittal is she has a very pronounced about 95 degree uh, kyphosis in the thoracolumbar area. Um, globally, she has a uh, balanced uh, sagittal um, uh, plane. And then if you look on the right, um, the coronal plane, she has a, about a 9,500 degree um, apex right thoracolumbar uh, scoliosis and um, some compensatory curves in the thoracic spine as well as in the, in the distal lumbar spine. Uh, I think one thing to point out, one of the sessions that we hosted a couple months ago was on coronal uh, plane deformity. And uh, the right is a very good example of one of those cases where the trunk is shifted to the convexity of the curve. So a, a, a bow type C a, or a um, uh, OBIE type two. And these are the cases that are very, very challenging to um, realign coronally. So that will come into play um, in moving uh, forward. So when I see these types of patients who are concerned for congenital uh, scoliosis, obtain a lateral bending x-rays to assess more of the flexibility of the compensatory curves above and below, get a full spine CD, CT, uh, I particularly think this is useful for um, modeling, uh, 3D modeling to plan for the surgery, um, something we can take intraoperatively and help us uh, with the resection. Also obtain a full spine MRI to evaluate for other neural axis abnormalities, which about 20 to 40% uh, <clears throat> prevalence. Um, in her, she had uh, no abnormalities. And they also obtain a renal ultrasound echocardiogram uh, and uh, didn't list it here, but a PFTs and all those were, were normal. So these are the lateral bending x-rays. Um, you can see on the right, there's not much change of the main um, deformity, which, were, which we expected, but more the left side gives us an information about the, the flexibility of the, of the compensatory curves in the th mid thoracic spine, as well as the distal lumbar spine. Um, and the important thing to note is that the L4 uh, vertebra horizontalizes over the L5. Um, these are images of the 3D model um, that we made. You can see here that very pronounced uh, failure formation and segmentation um, from about T9 to L1. Um, you can see the joining of the um, uh, congenital fusion of the ribs on the concave side. And then the posterior elements are very uh, displastic, displastic as well. Um, this is an image looking at the convex side um, of the deformity, and you can see um, that just the, the, that uh, congenital fusion. This is an MRI, um, and I think the thing to point out, which will come into play surgically, was this area of the spinal cord has some cord signal change right over that uh, apex of the kyphosis, uh, and that also on the bottom left there on the axial image, really hugging the, uh, the spinal cord which puts this at very high risk of a neural um, injury or motor changes intraoperatively. So in summary, this is a 26-year-old female, progressive back pain and deformity, who presented with a congenital kyphoscoliosis from T9 to L1 from a congenital fusion, and she was neurologically intact. So uh, my operative plan um, was as follows. We chose to do a T3 to L4 posterior instrumented fusion with an apical VCR T9 to T12. Uh, I chose to stop at L4 uh, because of that L4 horizontalizing over the L5 vertebral body, but um, I think that's going to be a nice point of discussion at the end of the case. So these are some interoperative photos. Um, you can see the rib prominence on the, um, on the left, and then you can see her trunk is shifted to the right, which we had seen uh, in the x-rays. Um, uh, looking at the spine after dissection uh, on the left, um, and I expose the ribs nice and far laterally. Uh, in order to access the uh, anterior um, aspect of the vertebral body. Um, as, and then we place the screws with navigation. I think it's very key to get good fixation in these cases because the deformity correction is very, very, um, it puts a lot of stress on the screws. Um, that's why I like to use navigation uh, to place these to ensure that we have very, very good fixation. On the left, you see um, you dissect around that um, congenital 
uh, fusion all the way to the front of the vertebral body. Uh, you're just going to have to take and remove the entire uh, front of it so you can correct the kyphosis. Otherwise, um, it won't uh, move very well. So you put spoons around the front. Um, and then before starting any, any, any laminectomies, you can see on the right, we place this uh, temporary rod. I like to do it in this type of construct. I place rods above and below uh, and then run a rod laterally uh, because that's also the rod that I'm going to shorten over and start my correction on um, after we have completed the VCR. So um, after doing the laminectomy, um, we had started to decancellate um, the, that, um, the, the congenital fusion on the concavity and the convexity. And, and we were working on the concavity right at the apex of the kyphosis. Um, we lost motors in the left leg. Um, they're 100% down in the iliopsoas and the quad. And um, we still had some, about 10%, in the uh, foot and the and the tib ant, which was a for in my eyes reassuring because it wasn't uh, complete, but it was only on the left. Um, at that time, we raised the blood pressure above 90, gave her some steroids, ensure that her hemoglobin was above 10. Um, but we continued to proceed because I think the goal um, to give it the best chance was to take the pressure off that spinal cord and shorten it. Um, so we proceeded. Um, we resected um, those the entire uh, fusion. And then the deformity correction proceeded through a variety of techniques um, that ranged from shortening over this temporary stabilizing rod and then doing a lot of rod exchanges with under contouring of the rod and cantilever maneuvers um, with each cantilever maneuver that opens up the anterior column. And then to, once we uh, had opened it up, um, we ended up placing an expandable cage and then again did some in situ bending, which then opens the anterior column um, a little bit more expanding the, the, the cage in the front. Um, and that's how we uh, corrected both the kyphosis and the uh, scoliosis. So this is our final construct. We ended up placing, um, actually placed an additional fourth rod across the construct. We were happy with the, the correction through the, um, the major cob. And then you can see the improvement in the kyphosis in the upper um, image relative to what we had started with on uh, the bottom image. Um, so she did very, very well after surgery. She actually woke up neurologically intact. There were some improvements in the MEPs during the case, but not to baseline, but she woke up uh, neurologically normal. Um, these were x-rays in the coronal plane um, at her uh, six-week, two-month post-op image. And you can see here that she's still, her, shit, her trunk is still shifted off to the right. Um, her shoulders are level and her pelvis is level, so she doesn't notice this uh, very much, but it really raises the question, um, of whether stopping at L4 was the right, right thing, whether we should have gone down one more to help uh, bring her over um, a little bit more to the left and correct the CSVL, um, whether, or whether this was okay and she'll correct over time as her obliques uh, strengthen. But one of the, and this is the sagittals, which I was very happy with. Um, you can see the improvement in the kyphosis um, and um, really her ability to stand upright was significantly improved. So um, she was a happy camper, but I'm hoping that over time that coronal plane will, will correct. So happy to take any questions. Yeah, like a terrific, uh, a terrific case, really nice reconstruction there. And this is an older patient, um, uh, uh, an adult, as you indicated. Um, you know, a, a couple of things I think are awfully important to emphasize with this is one, your decision to carry on. So when you lost the motor, certainly that can be a very, very intimidating event. Um, but I think you're completely right in recognizing that shortening the spinal cord, but most of the time in these deformities, uh, the risk factor for loss of motors is uh, the deformity angular ratio. And uh, in general, if we think about it in a coronal plane, a ratio of uh, more than 40 degrees. So if you've got 40 degrees of deformity per segment, that type of a short, sharp deformity uh, has got a high risk of uh, motor vote potential loss during surgery. And the sagittal plane is about 25 degrees. So more than 25 degrees of kyphosis uh, is, is the risk factor for a loss of motors intraoperatively. So this wasn't entirely un unexpected that there might've been a, a, a loss of motors. And the decision of whether or not to proceed is, is an important one. And I think that, uh, and I'll, I'll phrase this as a question, uh, perhaps rather than a statement, but uh, Alekos, what, what are your thoughts about when to proceed 
uh, versus when do you uh, lock things down and, and uh, perhaps get, get imaging or, or uh, look, look for a recovery? What are your thoughts? That's a good question. Um, I think that in the setting of having an incomplete loss of motors, um, that proceeding I think is very reasonable. Um, and especially given the fact that I thought it was due to the fact that there was great over the, over the um, over that fusion, I felt like the best way of improving her chances of getting better was to shorten and take away that pressure. Um, so when to stop is a hard it's a hard thing. I think when to stop is if you've tried everything and it hasn't hasn't worked, that may be that may be a reasonable time, but in my eyes, you have to give them the best chance um, with the techniques that you have to improve it, and especially in a young young person like this. I'd love to talk to others. Ben Sant, I'd love, love to hear from you on this. What are, what are your thoughts? Are you First, you know, when the um, uh, you decide to uh, get back, when did you uh, reset, start resetting? the the, uh, the pedicles or not because when you had this loss what was the emergency to do to get them back uh, because um, it these times but when when you lost the uh, potential first reaction just to go I'm going to raise the uh, the pedicles to get the, the core to drift or what, what what did you do to get this uh, MEP uh, to, to kick back again a little bit to get them a little bit better yeah, great question. So it was at the time when we were removing that um, pedicle, and so there was still some pressure on the um, on the spinal cord. So we ended up um, continuing with the resection um, of the pedicle, um, but even after it um, was not when it was removed, they had not completely resolved. Um, it was only when we had completed the resection and then shortened her. That it started to started to get better, um, and so yeah, it it, it 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 actually took a while. It didn't return very quickly. That's a beautiful case. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think one of the real take home messages here is um, uh, to, to really expect a high probability in patients with a high DIR of changes, and to um, to just just be confident to, to to move through it and shorten the spine is the secret here. And, you know, I, I like there's a couple of comments about the expandable cage you used. Uh, but firstly, uh, which side did you put that in the concavity or the convexity? And then, and then uh, so secondly, uh, th th this one comes from me, is uh, what are your thoughts about when you're really trying to shorten the anterior column about uh, uh, may maybe not even using uh, a cage uh, in front? I know that kyphosis is a big part of your deformity here, uh, but, but uh, you know, as you know, I tend to use a a shorter cage, uh, and, and, or even something that's just more sliced bone, and really, really trying to shorten from the back. What, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah. Um, so the first question, we placed it on the convexity, um, somewhat because it was easier to place. There was just more more room on that side. We had removed uh, three uh, nerves on each side, um, and I was initially placed it on the convexity, um, a because of access, but two. I was concerned with the motor um, motor deficit that putting on the convexity and lengthening on that side would potentially stretch the cord. So I ended up placing on the on the convexity as we shortened on that side. Um, to your question, uh, Dr. Bourbon, um, with the amount of bone that we had resected here, um, we needed something to fill that gap. And I wanted to correct the kyphosis because the sagittal plane was the most important um, um, deformity for her. Um, and I felt that by putting that expandable cage in the front and shortening the back, expanding in the front, we would be able to achieve uh, our goal. But if it had been less bone that we had removed, I, I, I would have used something that was probably static. And another consideration here is, of course, uh, tying off the nerve roots in, in, in general. Um, we can talk about pre-ganglionic versus post-ganglionic, but if somebody's already lost their motor vote potentials, that, that to me is a pretty clear contraindication. Well, I'm not going to tie off the nerve roots uh, after somebody's lost lost motors. But what are your yeah. thoughts there, Marcus? Yeah, that had happened. So we had clamped all the nerve roots um, for 10 minutes each, and there was no change in the MEPs, and we had then taken them uh, before we had lost the motors. 
Um, and so I'm not sure if that had, you know, increased her risk or, you know, decreased the threshold um, um, for her to have changes in the MEPs. But uh, I agree with you. If we had lost the MEPs, I would not have sacrificed the nerve roots afterwards. Terrific. Well, uh, I, I think we still got two, two more cases. Is that right? So let, let, let's transition. Is, um, is Rahul's next? So Rahul, please uh, share with us uh, the see general kyphosis case. Terrific. Excellent. All right. So just taking over the screen here. Um, so we have a three-year-old, uh, three years, 11 months, um, who had a prior L1 to 3 posterior spinal fusion and casting at DC Children's, um, <clears throat> subsequently had a hardware removal, uh, continued difficulty with potty training, uh, and he was not keeping up with his friends at school, uh, with running and playing. That's what prompted him to, to come in here. Past medical history, he has tetralogy of flow, hydronephrosis, uh, he did have the tetralogy of uh, fellow repaired. And then uh, like we talked about the L1 to three uh, posterior spinal fusion with casting. Uh, <laughs> on exam, uh, he was actually motor intact. Um, sensory was intact as well and uh, no uh, pathological reflexes. Um, so imaging prior to, to any of his uh, surgeries, um, you can see uh, at L2, um, he has this uh, failure of formation um, and congenital sky, uh, kyphosis uh, above that level. You can see that more here on the imaging um, and you can see some compression um, posteriorly there. Uh, he had the prior fusion and the hardware removal um, and his kyphosis continued to progress. So, um, Obviously, with his um, progression, his uh, issues, um, keeping up with his uh, friends and his um, uh, bowel and bladder issues, uh, they elected for surgical management. Uh, he underwent an L2 VCR, L1 to 3 anterior fusion uh, with T12 to L3 posterior spinal fusion. You can see on the post-op imaging, um, good correction of his kyphosis, obviously, um, at L2, the... Uh, um, vertebral body was removed um, and his posterior fusion there. Um, at follow up, he had a uh, cohort uh, in running and play. Uh, obviously, his parents are quite thrilled with his progress. And this is the x ray from six years uh, post op. So he maintained his alignment, is doing quite, quite well. Um, and this was a case with uh, Dr. Bourbon. Sorry, and uh, one of our uh, pediatric orthopedic colleagues. Um, I don't know if you want to chime in here, Dr. Bourbon, about your thoughts. Yeah, sure. Uh, maybe go back to the MRI scan. So this was an interesting uh, case from the point perspective of, well, what about just doing a, a posterior-based fusion? So at the age of three, this child um, did undergo a uh, posterior fusion in situ. I, I, I thought it was in situ, but the, uh, maybe you said, I, I guess there was hardware put in at another hospital. Yep. Um, and then uh, the hardware was taken out. And I'm, I'm not sure why, uh, to be honest, why the hardware was taken out, but clearly had a progression of deformity. And um, so in terms of the reliability of a, a, a posterior based fusion, uh, even if somebody under the age of five uh, in a congenital kyphosis, the, the natural history of this is awfully important to understand. Again, uh, John Hall wrote about this uh, series uh, from Children's Hospital and suggested that in our type one congenital kyphosis, so this is a the patient who's really got uh, some, some retropulsion of that uh, hemivertebra posteriorly, uh, the rate of neurologic progressive decline is, is very high. And of course, this person ended up uh, actually having a significant uh, loss in his developmental milestones. He uh, lost his, his urinary continence, uh, lost his, uh, uh, some of his, his, his gait. He, he was ataxic when he came in to see me. Um, and that's what led us to do the hemivertebral resection. Um, we, we had some, some good shots of this, but basically uh, the resection is, um, uh, in this instance, I think much easier to do from a posterior approach. Um, when you're working, when you're trying to do this from, uh, from an anterior approach, you're kind of just working into a, a deep hole. Whereas uh, from a posterior approach, um, uh, you can get into the disc, disc above and below and, and work to circumferentially and uh, 
it, it actually, the, almost all the work is done in the disk space. And um, so if you go go ahead to the post-op film there, we are able to get, uh, get him re realigned uh, quite nicely. Uh, and, and a big part of this deformity was actually the sagittal plane deformity. So I, I did use a, a very small inner body cage here and shortened across the, uh, the hemivertebral section. Um, I think that's a beautiful case. I have a question. So I, it's, it's interesting. I did exactly a, a similar case in Trinidad about two years ago uh, with a VCR like, like you did. Uh, uh, but I, I went uh, uh, one level further down. How long do you keep the patient in cast and brace with this uh, uh, construct where you only go one level uh, down? I think uh, uh, it's fantastic that you've been able to, to hold the spine uh, with only one level below the congenital malformation. Yeah, it's, it's an important question, Ms. Hall. You know, he was only, uh, I think he was less than five years old when we, we did the surgery. Right? His first surgery was age three. I think I did when he was five. Is that right, Rahul? I think he uh, was between four and five. Yeah, yeah so, he, so he's quite young and, and quite small. Um, I, I, I tend to put in big screws, uh, uh, and, so on that, and that's part of it. And, and I've got, with the anterior column support, I feel like that takes some strain off those uh, L, L3 screws. Um, I think that the, the cost of going to L4 versus L3 in this case is, is not insignificant. So, you know, obviously I think leaving him some mobility uh, was part of the goal. And in, in this instance, post-operatively, I, I did have him actually in a, in a cast. Uh, uh, I did not use a, a pre brace here. I had him in a cast and I kept him in that cast uh, for about four weeks. I, I cut out the uh, uh, a little window for his, uh, uh, to observe his wound, but I kept him in the cast uh, for only about four weeks. and. And thereafter, uh, I took him out and, and actually um, didn't have in any bracing at all. So um, I think with a short construct and somebody that was uh, relatively small and with, with, with big screws and anterior antibody support, I, I, I felt pretty comfortable with it. Um, we, we have some, some terrific photos that uh, that, that uh, Rule didn't, didn't uh, put in there, but uh, some terrific photos. He, he's actually a, a hockey player. Uh, and uh, uh, so I've got to, he made a whole collage of his activities, horse riding, hockey, you know, all, all sorts of uh, neat activities. So it was a pretty nice recovery. Um, one of the questions was how do you adjudicate it's some intraoperative uh, coronal correction? And, uh, you know, Jens uh, um, ju just did this uh, just before starting the symposium is I really believe in a 36 inch film. I think that's uh, awful, awfully useful. Uh, you know, in a small child like this, uh, it could even be a short film, but I think that looking at the pelvis and getting perpendicular pelvis, there's, there's no substitute uh, to that in my, in my hands. Um, and then how do you anticipate, or do I anticipate screw removal uh, and when? No, no. In, in, in general, uh, even in the, these younger younger children, the, uh, um, the, the, uh, 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 the, the uh, width of the canal is really, really set by, by age five and, and uh, so in general, no, I, I, I don't tend to take out implants uh, unless, there, unless there's some reason. But let, let's, let's transition. I think we've got one more case. We've got about uh, 15 minutes left or so. And, and I think, uh, Ian, have you got the last case? So uh, Ian, again, yes. one of our fellows, Ian came to us from the Mount Sinai a neurosurgery program. And Ian's heading to the University of Connecticut uh, next year. And, and Ian, uh, Ian did a recent case with us. Yes. So this is a, another congenital scoliosis case that I did with uh, Dr. Bourbon and one of our pediatric um, surgeons that does the same amount of spine. Um, this is actually a seven-year-old female patient, but uh, the diagnosis of scoliosis and some other congenital anomalies were, were actually discovered in utero. Um, so she was born with a solitary kidney with hydronephrosis, right thumb hypoplasia, as well as scoliosis. Um, at birth, um, she was she transferred her care to our uh, facility, and she was followed regularly. And so, um, at birth, it was a third, 35 degree thoracic levoscoliosis with multiple cervical and thoracic segmentation anomalies. Um, and here we see the X-rays at zero days old, as well as six months old. And there's a, a fully segmented right T8 vertebrae. So um, on evaluation, um, the spine was flexible. Um, the right thumb um, was developed, but there was no bone. 
Um, there was no stigmata of um, signs of sp spinal dysraphism and uh, her neurological exam was normal. Uh, other spinal anomalies, including tethered cord or dysraphism was uh, ruled out with a ultrasound, which was performed at five months old. And uh, um, here you can see the conus on the ultrasound to, to, and that was present at L2 to rule out tethered cord. And so she was followed regularly uh, over the years. Um, the, at the time, uh, given the fully segmented hemivertebra, uh, the team was aware there was a high risk for progression. But the goal at the outset was to observe at least until greater than five years old, at which time the vertebral canal would be at least 90% of the adult diameter. And the thought there was that the, the surgery would be safer, uh, higher, less risk, lower risk for neurological compromise. However, as you can see, even at uh, 12 months of age and nearly two months of age, there was already uh, fairly significant progression. Um, here you can see 40 degrees um, in a, with an upright film and then with traction, uh, she corrected about 25 degrees. However, a year later, uh, it was a 50 degree thoracic curve. Uh, that corrected to about 30 degrees with traction. Here are the films at three years and six years of note between three years old and six years old, the family relocated to New York City, um, but she was still followed regularly with um, upright films. And um, once she reached the threshold of, at five years, you can see it uh, with this, in the supine position at this stage for at this year, for every, for every reason she did not, um, there's a supine film, and then this is actually six and a half. So at six years, she her thoracic curve is 52 degrees in the sup supine position. And then at six and a half, it was 63 degrees in a full spine standing film. So at that time, given the progression uh, and her age, um, she, the surgical planning was initiated. Um, the thought was that the resection of the T8 hemivertebrae would prevent further, further uh, progression of a scoliosis. And so at that time, a CT scan, MRI, total spine and full X-ray, including bedding films were obtained. You go back, that was actually 3D. Let me just go backwards. Okay. So this is the 3D recon. Um, and so you can see a, a fully segmented T8 vertebrae in a posterior lateral position. Um, here and here, best seen. And here are standing prone and bending films. Uh, so, um, Again, 64 degrees and standing, uh, not much correction prone and um, in bending right, um, increased about 68, but it corrected about 47 when bending left. So she was um, brought to the OR position uh, prone. Uh, we performed a subperiosal dissection T6 to T10, TP to TP. Uh, posterior column osteotomies were performed um, above and below uh, the hemivertebrae. Um, at T8, we exposed about three centimeters of rib. Uh, we resected, resected that portion of the rib as well as the TP. Um, we bluntly dissected the periapical space preferentially to the anterior aspect of the thoracic spine before a laminectomy, temporary rod is placed. Um, and um, the roots uh, above and below were uh, the T8, emerging T8 root was identified, tied off, um, and sectioned. And then in terms of resecting the actual hemivertebrae, uh, carefully dissected uh, the disc above and below uh, to try to mobilize the hemivertebrae and uh, ideally with, by, with that technique, able to minimize blood loss by getting into the bone. Um, so the material body was resected and uh, the gap was filled with morselized autographs. Here are the 
uh, post-op, uh, intraoperative films. Um, and this was actually done actually a couple of weeks ago. So we don't have uh, significant uh, follow-up beyond her immediate post-op films. Um, but here are the pre-op versus post-op. So post-op, she's um, still maintain about a 40 degree um, curve. The segment of which we fuse are straight, but she still had some um, decompensation above and below. So in terms of managing that, managing those curves, she was uh, done well neurologically. She was discharged on post-op day four, and she was discharged in a bivalve uh, TLSO um, to provide able to And then uh, once wounded healed, uh, she will transition into a custom, custom Wilmington side uh, scoliosis TLSO um, to help with uh, ideally straightening out the upper thoracic curve. So um, obviously more to come, well, should we follow closely? Um, Dr. Bourbon, do you have any other comments? You're muted, Sig. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, in, in uh, nice, nice case. I think this is a case that exemplifies uh, perhaps how much easier a correction can be earlier uh, than, than waiting. This is a, a girl who uh, between age three and six had moved to New York and was under the care of uh, another, another group there and uh, didn't come back uh, to San Francisco until uh, her curve had progressed quite dramatically. I think that there was a stage where perhaps a growing rod might have been a reasonable option there. In this instance, what we did, what we did and uh, this was actually Dr. Diab's patient um, so I was, I was sort of the, the uh, technical assistance here, but uh, the, the plan was to uh, reset the hemivertebra. And you see, we, we got uh, the sections from T6 to, uh, to T9 uh, quite, quite uh, parallel. Uh, and, and this is a uh, patient is going to, she only, she's still only seven years old, uh, probably going to end up with a, a growing rod construct above. We talked about doing a Schiller type technique where we uh, did the hemivertebra resection fuse the apex and then put in a groin rod. Uh, but in this instance, Dr. D, I want to see what she looked like in a brace and, and uh, where there might be some flexibility before committing to either a groin rod or part of uh, his, his consideration may actually be to tether the apex. We'll, we'll see how, uh, uh, how, that, how, that, how that goes and how she looks in a brace as we get some further follow-up. But a very challenging case, and a, a, again, a, an example of how rapidly uh, progressive these hemivertebra, especially hemivertebra with contralateral rib fusions or contralateral um, uh, bar, uh, can really progress uh, quite rapidly over time. So, fo following these children uh, frequently is, is is really critical. I think a question here from. Uh, can I see that. Uh, I guess you answered that, Ian, about the te tethered cord. And, you know, in general, the, the idea of a tethered cord, so she didn't have a tethered cord. And as Ian pointed out, um, a, a, a large percentage of patients with congenital scoliosis do have intraspinal anomalies. And those intraspinal anomalies may include a syrinx. Uh, they may include a, a, a diastemal myelia. Uh, they may include a, a tethering of the cord. Um, what, one of the important questions is when do we need to uh, detether a cord that is tethered? Uh, and in, in a lot of these cases, in the cases that, that we showed today, uh, in general, um, we're shorting the spine. So um, th this is something that we don't necessarily routinely need to, uh, to detether uh, when we're doing a spine shortening procedure. If we're gonna do a major scoliosis correction and, and lengthen the concave side, well then, then detethering is an important part of the procedure. But for spine shortening procedures in these short, short cases you've seen, uh, in general, we don't actually need to detether the spine. In fact, we've, we've had some experience in, in treating uh, uh, tethered cords with uh, spinal shortening osteotomies, vertebral column resections. Um, hey, Sig, uh, question about your question about your first. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised with the, despite this. Uh, that that read to me that you did that she has such a persistent coronal imbalance, which is uh, a, a little bit unexpected. So, 
Any any reason? Do you have any uh, reason to explain that why she has? So you did a, a very good correction of the uh, thoracic curve, and then she still has a very significant uh, coronal imbalance. Any, any reason you have just to explain this? And just like uh, sometimes we uh, malformation in the upper neck or the uh, the lumbosacral junction, like uh, uh, sacrum malformation, something like that. I'll, I'll repeat that because you were cutting in and out there uh, and hopefully everybody can hear me. So uh, uh, Vincent is making the uh, appropriate observation that it's a bit surprising that her, uh, she remained with such a significant coronal plane uh, uh, deformity and, uh, and also rotational deformity despite a, a very complete correction of that hemivertebra segment. Uh, so those four segments we fused were nicely corrected, but um, I think there's two reasons for that. Vincent. One is that she actually did have a pretty complex mixed uh, deformity above. So in the cervical thoracic spine, she actually had a, a, a significant uh, scoliosis there that was congenital. So she had a mixed picture to a scoliosis above. Uh, the worst was certainly a T8, but uh, she had a, a mixed uh, uh, um, hemimetameric shift above with some asymmetry. But also I think over the age three to age seven, I think that that, uh, that that thoracic curve really became a more of a structural curve. It was really quite flexible when she was younger. I think that became a much more structural curve. So uh, I, I do think more is gonna to need to be done with her. And I think that uh, after we see what happens with superior bracing, she's probably gonna end up with a, a growing rod of some sort. Uh, so she'll end up with having had a uh, apical uh, fusion um, uh, with, with the growing rod above and below to control because she's still got a lot of growth remaining again. She's only seven years old. Hey, Sig, one more question for you if we have time. I just, um, the L2 posterior hemivertebra, a beautiful correction on that. What, what was your strategy for managing roots on that? Because of course you can't sacrifice those roots, but you're doing a complete resection rather than a PSO. Yeah, yeah, so... Um, Technically, a, a real tip on that is, of course, you know, doing your uh, complete facetectomy is at one, two, and two, three, isolating the pedicle of L2. And then everybody wants to go into the bone first. And, and I can't emphasize enough, uh, and you know this, Lionel, uh, you and I have done enough of these, uh, is take, taking a disc out first. There's no bleeding, right? So you take out the disc, and then the, 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 the bony part comes out quite easily, especially in the child. Oftentimes, uh, one of the things John Hall used to say is the soft tissues are hard and the hard tissues are soft. So uh, in this instance, taking out the disc above, above and below. And then I had such a gap in there. Uh, you, you saw I actually just used a T-lift cage. So that was a, or I actually, I actually I think it was a pure mesh cage in that case. But oftentimes I'll just use a, a T-lift cage, maybe 12, 14 millimeter cage, put that anteriorly and I'll fulcrum over that, that T-lift cage. And, and, a, and a big part of my theory in these cases is I really try and shorten it as much as I can. So it's pretty unusual that I'll use the expandable cage. 